Welcome everyone to Wednesday night Bible study here at Trinity Assembly of God. We're glad to have you with us again this evening. And uh, we're with you online and at the same time in person here at the church. And so uh, one way or the other, we're delighted to be able to share with you from the Word of God and from this book that has really uh, ministered to our heart up until this point titled The Indwelling Life of Christ, All of Him in All of Me. And I really believe that it teaches the essence of Christianity, what Christianity is all about. So uh, we'll tell you how you can get a copy of that book, free and postage paid. Uh, we're looking at the sixth chapter tonight. This is our fifth study. And the, the chapter's titled, When Doing Right is Wrong. And so Major Ian Thomas began by saying this, In the wilderness, Moses commanded the people, you shall not at all do what you are doing here today. Every man doing what is right. Now that's Deuteronomy 28 and verse 8. So was he telling them not to continue doing what was right? Is it an always right to do what is right? Aren't we supposed to always do what is right? And then he goes on and says, listen to Moses' words in full. You shall not at all do as you are doing here today every man doing what is right in his own sight. It's all the difference in the world. We're not to be doing what is right in our eyes, but what is right in God's eyes, not just our own eyes. And so he goes on and says, the people were doing only what was right in their own eyes without consulting the one who alone has the right to decide what is right and wrong. When doing right is wrong. And as I was looking at the chapter, I wanted to break it into two parts. I want you to first think about this in concerning morals and then concerning ministry. First of all, I want to talk about it in regard to morals. When doing right is wrong. We know uh, the, the term situational ethics. Uh, we know the philosophy that there are no absolutes. Uh, we know the subject of moral relativity. Uh, everything is moral relative to the situation, the circumstance. And what may be right for you may be wrong for me, and what may be wrong for me may be right for you, and so forth. And it's gotten to the place where we once again need to pronounce a woe to, to the situation that we're living in, like Isaiah did in his day in Isaiah 5 and 12, when he said, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light, and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. He's addressing those who can't tell the difference between good and evil. I think in a lot of ways, children can be wiser than adults. Uh, I read about a list of uh, absolute true list of children that they put together, things they thought were absolutely true and right. Uh, and the children wrote these various remarks. Uh, what is absolutely true, no matter how hard you try, you can't baptize cats. Another wrote, when your mom is mad at your dad, don't let her brush your hair. If your sister hits you, don't hit her back. They always catch the second person. Never ask your three-year-old brother to hold a tomato. You can, can't trust dogs to watch your food. Puppies still have bad breath even after eating a Tic Tac. Never hold a dust buster and a cat at the same time. Never wear polka dot underwear under white shorts. And another one wrote, you can't hide a piece of broccoli in a glass of milk. And so kudos to the kids because, you know, they've got their own set of absolute right and wrong and what is truth. But when it comes to the adults, not always so. I read this the other day. Uh, according to a 1992 Gallup poll, 72% of all adults agreed, quote, that there is no such thing as absolute truth. 1992, 72% of adults, there is no such thing as absolute truth. 30 years earlier, in 1962, 84% of adults, according to a Gallup poll, did believe in the existence of absolute truth. Today, it's even worse than that. 
The late Professor Alan Bloom wrote a book that was titled The Closing of the American Mind, and he made this statement. There is one thing a professor can be absolutely certain of. Almost every student entering the university believes or says he believes that truth is relevant. In our entire educational system, uh, not only in our universities and our colleges, but even in our high schools and our elementary schools, the generally accepted concept is, is there's no such thing as absolute right or wrong that truth is relevant, relevant to each individual. And so the educators are taking advantage of this to shape the mind of a culture. Now Jesus came for a very different reason. He said, for this cause I was born, and for this cause I've come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. John 18 and verse 37, Jesus came for the very reason to bear witness to the truth. So I want to share three thoughts on this subject of when doing right is wrong. And first of all, I want you to think about the danger in the attack against the truth. We're living in unprecedented times, but they haven't just come about overnight. They've been in the making for many, many years. We've been in a cultural uh, revolution that's a result of cultural relativism. And I wanted to share just a few quotes on that topic. Shiren Ibadi said this on cultural relativism. The idea of cultural relativism is nothing but an excuse to violate human rights. Charles Coulson said, the problem is that relative, uh, relativism provides no sure foundation for a safe and orderly society. Randall Terry from Operation uh, Rescue uh, made this remark, once you depart from the Ten Commandments, you have relativism, humanism, the abandonment of absolutes. You have anything. How long before child pornography is mainstream? When you take the Ten Commandments away and you erase those absolutes, we go haywire as a society. Peter Kreft said this, Moral relativism has a reputation for being compassionate, caring, and humane but it is an extremely useful philosophy for tyrants. Paul Johnson said if you depart from moral absolutes, you get into a bottomless pit. Communism and Nazism were catastrophic evils which both derived from moral relativism. Their differences were minor compared to their similarities. And then Martin Luther King Jr. said this, you cannot solve the problem by turning to communism, for communism is based on an ethical relativism and a metaphysical materialism that no Christian can accept. With all the talk of socialism and Marxism and elements of communism being brought into the political fray in America, we're living in some very perilous times indeed. Uh, again, Colson called this the cultural crisis of our time. John MacArthur said it's a frontal assault on the very person and character of God. And finally, Josh McDowell says that it's the last step on the road to anarchy. And that's what we're seeing happening in our world today because we've gotten to the place where people are calling good evil and evil good. And when doing right is wrong, and that is when we're doing right in our own eyes. Uh, R.C. Sproul said this, if, everyone, if everything rather is relative, including ethics and values, then we are in deep weeds, the kind of deep weeds one finds in a jungle. And it's becoming a jungle out in our world today. We're living in a day where principled convictions have been replaced by political correctness. And uh, the pressure is being put upon us today like never before. Our entire nation, America, has uh, undergone a, a moral lobotomy. Our whole way of thinking is being changed. Even reasoning as to the simple things as to what is right and wrong. There was a cartoon that was in the USA Today. It had a picture of a young George Washington. And he was holding a hatchet in one hand and kneeling uh, next to a fallen cherry tree. And the cartoon has him looking up to his father and saying, Dad, my teacher says I cannot tell a lie. I cannot tell the truth. I cannot tell the difference. 
and that we have a, a world today in which we're teaching and brainwashing our kids into thinking you can't tell the difference between right and wrong because right could be right for one person and wrong for another. The big word today is tolerance. We have to be tolerant of other people's definitions of right and wrong. Tolerism. Tolerism means what's true for you may not be true for me and vice versa. But have you ever thought there is no room for tolerance in the other areas of life? For instance, in the chemical laboratory, there is no room for tolerance. You allow tolerance in a chemical laboratory and you'll have an explosion. If you make room for tolerance in music, you don't have melody and harmony. You have dissonance. You've got sour notes. There's no room for tolerance in music or mathematics. In mathematics, it's either exactly right or it's completely wrong. There is no middle ground when you use an equation and come out with uh, a fact. No room for tolerance in biology. You know, one contradiction, one result that contradicts the other results, uh, uh, what it does is it uh, does away with a thousand experiments and validates the experiment uh, when it goes wrong one, one time. It just nullifies it. There's no room for tolerance in the athletic field. You know, athletics are uh, based on rules and no favorites. If you uh, forget the rules or you play favorites, what's the point of even being out there? There's no tolerance in the athletic field. In the garage, when you go to your mechanic, uh, the mechanic will tell you that a piston ring has to fit the cylinder wall within one thousandth part of an inch or your engine won't run properly, won't run smoothly. So there's no room for tolerance in a garage. There's no room for tolerance in any of these areas. Yet we're told there's room for tolerance in morality and righteousness and holiness and common decency in our country. And that we ought to be tolerant in these areas. The word that we need is not tolerance. The word that we need is truth. We need truth to no longer be fallen in the streets when it comes to morals and ethics. Uh, we understand that it's an attack, and it's a dangerous attack on truth. When there's an attack on truth, right and wrong, friends, it's an attack on God. Because it says there's no absolutes. And to say there's no absolutes is to say there is no God. There's no sovereign. Because God is the ultimate absolute. He really is the only absolute. In God, there is no error. In God, there is no imperfection. In God, there's no flaw. There is no limit. God is the standard of absolute. So, there's no God. There's no scripture. For deny truth, to deny truth is to deny the word of God. Because Jesus said concerning the word of God, he spoke to the Father and said, Your word is truth. John 17, 17. So, to uh, deny truth is to deny to deny a sovereign, to deny the scriptures, even to deny the Son himself. Because if you deny the truth, you deny Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father uh, but through me. So the effort really is to deny God, deny the Bible, to deny the Word of God, to deny the Son of God, because these are absolute truths. And why is this so dangerous? Because when you take away the God of the Word, and you take away the Word of God, you take away the only objective basis that we have for morality, purity, and holiness. It, it's the standard that has been removed, and everything else is cast to the wind. Because without God, the Bible, right and wrong, becomes just simply a matter of a person's personal opinion. There were a couple of men that's gotten a heated argument with one another and they couldn't resolve it and so they decided that they would each visit a wise man that lived in the community and uh, see his thoughts on it to see if he could help them uh, resolve the dispute so uh, the next day one man went to him and uh, gave his side and uh, the wise man said you are absolutely right and with a smug satisfied look the man left well the next day the other man came to give his side and the reply from the wise man is, you are absolutely right. And with a smug, satisfied look, he also uh, went away, got up and left. The wise man's wife had overheard the, both of these conversations, and she came into the room and confronted her husband. She said, listen, 
One man came into this room with one story. Another man came into this room with another story. And you told both of them that they were right. Now, both men cannot be right. The husband looked at his wife and said, you are absolutely right. And uh, when everyone's absolutely right and they're going a hundred different directions, how could you tell right from wrong? Always remember a principle. This is one we should never forget. Our behavior determines, uh, are determined rather by our belief. What we believe will determine our behavior. So when truth goes out the window, guess what? There are two other things that go out the window. Our morality goes out the window with truth. And we're seeing that across America today. But not only does morality go out the window, justice goes out the window. If you go into a, a court of law, a witness will be called upon to swear that he will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Now why? Because without truth there could be no justice. Because you see, uh, justice is based on truth. And I've got to ask the question, especially across America today, where is justice? We see injustice everywhere. People are decrying injustice. But they're trying to promote justice in very unjust ways. And so there's a danger when we begin to attack truth, moral absolutes. Uh, and we resort to situational ethics. We begin to rationalize and justify the things that we do, wrong things that we do, and we claim them to be right. There's a danger in attacking the truth. There's a delight when it comes to affirming the truth of God. Because you see, God's truth is eternal. In Psalm 100 verse 5, God said, it, it says that His truth endures to all generations. There's an enduring quality to the truth of God and endures to every generation. Understand that truth is absolute. Truth never, never becomes obsolete. Truth is truth always. What was true a million years ago is true today and will be true a million years from now. And so we need to realize that His truth endures. So when you champion truth, understand you're championing something that is enduring. But there was a little story of a man who went by to see an old friend who was a music teacher. His friend uh, was holding a little violin, sat it down, and greeted his friend. His friend said, what's the good news today? The old teacher was silent, just got up, walked across the room, picked up a little small hammer and a pitchfork, and he struck the pitchfork. And that note rang out through the room. He said, this is an A. It is an A today. It was A five years ago. It will be a 10,000 years from now. The soprano upstairs sings off key. The tenor across the hall flattens out his high notes. The piano downstairs is terribly out of tune. He then struck that note again. But my friend, that is an A. Always has been, always will be. And that is the good news for today. The good news for today is you can rely on the truth, the truth as it is in Jesus Christ. The truth is recorded in the Word of God. The truth is it's found in God Himself. You can trust in it, and you can know it. Jesus said, you shall know the truth. There's a school of thought today that doesn't necessarily deny truth, but simply states that nobody can really know the truth. But Jesus said, you shall know the truth. The truth is something that you can know and understand. Jesus said in John 16, 13, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. And God made man to be dependent on the Holy Spirit to guide us into truth. Now, why is there such an effort to remove God, to remove the Bible from society, from schools, to take the truth out of life, to take God himself out of life? Because then you could become your own God. You can determine your own truth. You can determine what's right and wrong. And every man can do what is right in his own eyes. But friends, the result of that is chaos and tyranny. It's a societal meltdown. James Merritt told the story of a man who walked to work every day and he'd always stop uh, by a clock master's store, just looking through the store window. And he would synchronize his watch with the clock that stood in the window of the clockmaker's shop. 
And the clockmaker maker watched him do this for several weeks. And then one day, uh, struck up a conversation with him and asked him what kind of work that he did. The man reluctantly admitted that he worked as a timekeeper at the nearby factory. And his manufacturing watch, uh, or rather malfunctioning uh, watch, his watch was a working right, made it necessary to constantly readjust it. And uh, so uh, it was his job to ring the closing bell every day at 4 o'clock. So he would synchronize his watch with the clock in the window to guarantee he was right. And as soon as he told the clockmaker this, the clockmaker just threw his head back laughing uncontrollably. He said, uh, what, what? He said, what's so funny? He said, well, I hate to tell you this, but my clock in the window doesn't work very well either. And I've been adjusting it every day to the bell that I hear every afternoon from the factory at 4 o'clock. And that just is telling as to what we're seeing in society today. We just keep readjusting our clocks to everyone else's constantly changing clock and the whole thing is out of sync with the truth of God. What we need to do in order to be accurate is to adjust our clock by God's timepiece, which is His Word. Align ourselves with His Word. Get in synchronization with His Word, which is never wrong, always right, because it's the truth. There's, an, a, there's a great danger in attacking the truth. And we're seeing the truth under attack today in bizarre ways like never before. Justification of the most heinous things that you can imagine. There's a delight in affirming the truth because His truth endures to all generations. It's the everlasting Word of God. But there's a deliverance also that comes in accepting truth when we accept the truth of God. Because you see, truth isn't just for the head. Truth is for the heart, for the heart. Jesus said again, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Now, we've been talking about absolutes, absolute right and wrong, which God himself determines. Did you know that the word absolute comes from two Latin words? The word ab means from, and the word salvare means to set free. So absolute, the word absolute literally means to set free from. Absolutes set us free from. Free from lies, free from deception, free from error. The truth will set you free. And Jesus came to, to manifest the truth and bear witness of the truth. And he himself is the truth, the truth of God. And there are a lot of people that are struggling and battling in bondage today needing to be set free. Friends, we need, we need to understand four truths if we're ever going to be set free. And if we understand and accept these four truths, we can be liberated from any prison that we're in, any bondage that we're in in this life. There's the truth about salvation. The absolute truth is anyone can be saved. This gospel of Jesus Christ is for the whole world. Red, yellow, black, white, brown, there is no racism involved with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ belongs to the whole world, to every man. And we need to accept the truth of the gospel that anyone can be saved. It's a gift that anyone can have. The truth about salvation, the truth about sin, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And all of us need to be saved. We need to know the truth and accept the truth about self. You no longer have to be controlled by you. The good news is the old you can die and Jesus can raise up a new you. And you don't have to be controlled by the old you. In 2 Corinthians 5.17 it says, If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. So we need to know the truth, the truth, the truth about salvation, about sin, about our own selves. We're not to rely on ourselves. We're to let Jesus come and live his life through us and make us new. We need to know not only the truth about ourselves, but the truth about Satan. Satan no longer can have dominion over you. The Bible says, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. 1 John chapter 4, verse 14. We understand that these four truths are essential for us being broken free from the prison of bondage. People are crying out for freedom. People are crying out for liberty, crying out for justice. This is to be found in Jesus Christ. 
Paul Harvey told a story many years ago, uh, the famed radio commentator, and uh, in it he told a, about an experiment involving a chimpanzee, in, in which the scientists were determined to teach it to write and to communicate on paper. And for 14 years they had worked with the chimpanzee. These scientists labored diligently, patiently with the chimpanzee, providing things in its cage to enable it to form certain syllables. 14 years they've been trying to get it where it can write a sentence on paper. And finally the day arrived, it seemed the chimpanzee was actually going to construct a sentence from syllables that it had been learning. And so word got out and scientists from all over the world traveled and uh, gathered in, uh, to, to see this, to watch this, and they watched breathlessly as symbols were formed into words and written into a sentence. At last, Harvey went on and said, the first message from the world's most pampered, most cared for, most uh, patently, uh, patiently rather trained chimpanzees in history was about to come forth. So they could hardly contain themselves, the scientists, as they pressed around the cage to read the history-making sentence what had the chimpanzee written? These words. Let me out. Let me out of the cage. Friends, people are in a cage of their own making. We're trying to break free with the exact, exact opposite of what we need. We need truth. Jesus said, you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. If you'll accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, He will take the key of salvation. He will unlock the shackles of sin, self, and Satan, and then He will set you free. And the Bible says, He whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Now our chapter, I said, uh, speaks to me two things about morals in general. And when uh, doing good is wrong. Uh, but it also speaks of ministry. Let me read the verse again that Major uses here. Deuteronomy 12 and 8 and then I'll, I'll add verse 9. Verse 8 says again, you shall not at all do as you are doing here today. Every man doing what is right in his own eyes. Verse 9 continues, for as yet you have not come to rest the rest and the inheritance which the Lord your God is giving you. And so here I think the focus is not just on uh, basic morality and basic right and wrong, but it's in what you do, doing righteousness. I think it involves ministry. I think it involves serving the Lord. And there are many people that try to serve the Lord out of their own mind or out of their own ingenuity or because of pressures they put upon themselves or pressures that other people put upon them regarding ministry. And the reason that they were everybody just running and frazzled and uh, worn down and had not found their rest is because they hadn't entered into their rest. They hadn't entered into their inheritance. And you know, you could burn out in ministry. You can burn out running from pillar to post. You could, in a church, grind down. You could be as busy as a proverbial beehive and everybody just exhausted because we're doing things uh, that are right in our own eyes rather than letting the Holy Spirit lead us, letting the Holy Spirit guide us, letting the Holy Spirit direct us in ministry. Not just doing what's right in our own eyes, but entering into that rest, entering into that inheritance. What's that rest and inheritance? That's just learning to rest in Jesus Christ and allowing the Holy Spirit now to direct us and to guide us. Uh, he ended the, the chapter Major did with 2 Corinthians 3 and 5 from the Amplified. Not that we are uh, sufficiently qualified in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency and qualifications come from God. Paul was saying that we don't minister out of our own sufficiency. We don't minister out of our own qualifications. We don't serve God out of uh, our own abilities. Nothing qualifies us. And we can claim nothing that qualifies us. Our sufficiency in ministry comes from the Lord, the Lord himself. As Paul was said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Paul made the statement uh, concerning the apostles. He said, I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but Christ, or the, rather the grace of God, 
that was with me. That was Jesus in him. God's grace was doing the work. God's grace made Paul into the apostle of the second mile. God's grace and his presence and his spirit, the very life of Jesus, is what made him sufficient for ministry because after all, it was Jesus doing the ministry through him. And he understood that. He was drawing from the source. We could become so engaged in ministry and so involved, wear so many hats that we're really not effective in anything. And uh, we could be shamed and could coerced into it many times in church. There are what are called toxic churches that constantly put guilt trips on people for not doing 101 different things. We need to teach people how to hear the voice of God, to be led by the Holy Spirit, and that each one will be fit into their ministry and the whole thing will work the way God intended. John Wesley was 35 years old when he was saved. He lived for the Lord 53 years. He died at 88. For 53 years, John Wesley preached the gospel. Often five times a day he would preach. Traveled over 250,000 miles on horseback. Uh, John Wesley built orphanages. He built churches. He and his brother compiled hymnals. Uh, he wrote over 200 uh, volumes. And on and on and on he worked and labored. But he learned the secret of ministering in the power of the Holy Spirit. Ministering under the direction of the Holy Spirit. Not pressured, not coerced, not forced, but being led by the Spirit. And so he was able to enter into that rest and enter into that inheritance. And so a labor didn't become a drudgery. It's possible to be tired in the work or in the labor. But when you're ministering this in the spirit, you'll never get tired of the labor or of the work. Because that's where your heart is. Because God's the one who's put it in your heart. Because it's God in your heart himself putting it there. So in regard to morals, uh, it's wrong to do right when we're simply doing right in our own eyes. We need to do what's right in God's eyes in His Word. And when it comes to ministry and serving the Lord, we need to be laboring and serving Jesus Christ and ministering for Him. But we need to do it uh, by the grace of God working in us. And we need to do it by the sufficiency that God gives us. And we need to realize that He'll be the one that will sustain us in it. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful, Lord, for this truth in this chapter here. When doing right is wrong. We want to do right and know that right is right when it's right in your eyes, God. So help us to be students of your word and then listen to the Holy Spirit's leadership and guidance. Help us not a single one to fall prey to the cultural relativism, God, the cultural changes, the uh, brand new redefining of everything practically that is right or wrong the justifying of wrong and the, the demonizing of things that are right. Woe unto them who call evil good and good evil. God, deliver our nation from these kinds of deceptions and help us to realize that it's the indwelling Jesus that will lead and guide us into the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. In his name we pray, amen. Just call the church office and uh, we'll make arrangements to get you a copy of the book if you want to participate each week. And uh, we look forward again to being back with you next week. We'll take a look at that sixth chapter and uh, kind of dig into that a little bit. So uh, read and study, and we'll look forward to seeing you next week. God bless.